families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Families Divided TV. In this episode, Zach Floyd, who was a psychotherapist, associate evaluator, and coach with the Men's Resource Center of West Michigan, will be speaking with us. In situations where parental alienation is present, there's usually more in play than just the problematic parent-child interactions. Many families in these situations are intricately involved in the family court system, as well as intersecting and sometimes interacting with a lot of professionals and governmental agencies. Additionally, other organizations and professionals, such as schools and teachers, can suddenly be thrust into a new reality when they are seduced into or asked to opine family dynamics. Sometimes in these situations, these professionals or organizations can be unwitting accomplices to a worsening alienation dynamic. This training is going to help you better understand these unwitting accomplices. It will better prepare you to navigate the challenge involved when intersecting with potential negative and advocates in the professional world, while you are also counteracting the behavior of an alienating spouse and alienated child. This training will prepare you to cope and manage with professionals that align themselves with a faulty narrative about you. This is a great episode. This is Zach's first time with us, and this was really a good presentation. So you may want to get your pen and paper uh, ready for this episode. We're going to be back with it in just a moment, right after these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. Hello, my name is Zach Flood. I work with the Men's Resource Center of West Michigan at the Fountain Hill Center of Grand Rapids. I'm an associate evaluator and psychotherapist, um, and I work within the field of parental alienation. I'm here to talk about uh, unwitting accomplices, um, which is something that a lot of families and parents have to have to navigate, and it can be really tricky um, and emotionally laden. So I would love to speak about that today and provide some clarity in terms of what it means and what we can do about it. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, is this chart that you have in front of you. And what you'll see here is it is a um, multi-systemic representation of what alienation can be. Um, in the middle, you'll see that child's response. And in the first circle there, you will see a lot of the um, closely related individuals and how they interact with that child. So you'll see the rejected parents' reactions, aligned parents, and siblings, and all that. Um, but on the outside, you'll see more of a multi-systemic view of what comes into an alienation dynamic. And one of those boxes on the outside towards the bottom there is aligned professionals. Um, and you'll see how it is directly connected to the personality of the rejected parent, to the divorce and conflict litigation. But also, you can see that arrow goes directly into that child's response. And that can show how intertwined this part of the system can be. And it can come through uh, direct contact by all the parties involved. And it can just really um, metastasize the problem if it gets to this point. And so I want to demonstrate for you, everyone today, 
how um, how all of that plays out and what we can do about it. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the history of of trauma in general and how this plays ultimately into this into this ongoing dynamic. And so after World War II in Vietnam, there was a lot of movement towards this study of this thing called trauma, which back in the day didn't really have a lot of attention. Uh, there was words like shell-shocked and battle fatigue and all these things that were thrown around. And eventually so much work was done, so much was found out that it really made its way into how psychotherapists and the professionals um, were trained. And so uh, for instance, for myself, when I was in school and in graduate school, I had a whole class dedicated strictly to trauma, uh, treating it, identifying it, and all these things. And so because of that, a lot of emphasis is put on preventing and treating tra traumatic events and, and traumatic interactions and all these things. And so um, that plays into how um, professionals um, will will interact with families because so much is done to to mitigate the dangers of of this of this thing that was discovered and, and, and emphasized over the past few decades. Um, and so because of that, there is an inherent bias sometimes within a lot of these professional organizations and professionals that are interacting with families because of all the training and all the emphasis put on this on this thing. So I want to describe um, a few of these different professionals that may interact with your family and how they might become unwitting accomplices to an alienation dynamic. And that can come through a lot of different ways. And I want to go through those one by one here. But it's important to remember that a lot of this can come from this emphasis that was put on uh, trauma over the, over, the, over the decades. So the first one I want to speak about is, is protective services. Now, this has a lot of different names in Michigan, where, where I work. Uh, it's called Child Protective Services, it's DCFS, there's a bunch of different names, but inherently we want to talk about organizations that are put together for the sole purpose of uh, investigating allegations of abuse and neglect, especially among children. And so while these organizations provide a necessary and wonderful service of protecting our children from trauma and abuse, sometimes they can be uh, used in nefarious ways to, to further and deepen an alienation dynamic. And so some of the reasons that may be is a lot of them aren't necessarily trained in parental alienation. I don't want to speak in broad latitudes here, but um, there are plenty of individuals that may not be trained in parental alienation, at least to the same level as they have been deeply trained in trauma and identifying it. And so usually their sole purpose is just to rule out abuse and neglect um, rather than going after uh, an alienating parent it just isn't in their core tenets a lot of times. And so those services can be called upon multiple times to, to investigate allegations that may come up. Um, and we'll talk about how that may come up later. But that the simple presence of investigations can be actually a, a big driving force around the 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 deepening of an alienation dynamic is, is as a parent can say, well, he's been investigated by CPS or DC, DCFS multiple times. How could you trust an individual like that? So I was actually a part of a case where, uh, as an evaluator, where over uh, 20 calls to CPS were made with allegations of sexual and physical abuse. And all, and there was eight full investigations and all eight found no preponderance of evidence to suggest abuse and neglect. In this instance, uh, this parent stuck with it and um, was able to get an evaluation and was able to have ha have a finding of, of of an alienation dynamic being present. But that just shows you how um, uh, an agency like that can be called on over and over and repeat the same work over and over, and that can pile up. Um, and they are just doing their jobs, which is they're trying to investigate credible allegations of, of abuse, but um, in hindsight, you can see how they are going to be an unwitting accomplice in an alienation dynamic rather than trying to protect the children from, from this abuse uh, dynamic. Okay. And so worst case scenario is sometimes uh, these agencies aren't perfect and they can make a false positive. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And that can leave a permanent mark on someone's record where 
uh, a lot of interventions from the court can be justified based on a substantiation of abuse and neglect. And a lot of that can happen from um, poor reactions to an alienation dynamic where a parent is, is not, um, is not put together or not reacting in a way that's conducive for growth and, and healing. And they can be reactionary and, and do abusive things. And all of a sudden, a false positive can happen. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're in a space where that, that can't be removed from anybody's record. And so moving on here, I want to go to the next thing, which is law enforcement, which is going to be somewhat related to this. But um, a lot of times police or, or other investigative agencies and law enforcement can be called to an address to address abuse and neglect, just similar to what the protective services might be might be called to do. Um, but that can also uh, l play itself into a narrative where well, he's got or she has cops, you know, at her door every every other week. How can you trust that? How, how come how can I allow my kid to, to go over there? Uh, and their incentives and, and training dictate that they have to address these allegations of abuse because that is that is what's highlighted. That's what's emphasized. Um, and there's also the 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 worst case scenario of, of lethality that, that has to be considered and it should be considered. But you can see how if that is injected into an alienation dynamic, all of a sudden, again, it can deepen this uh, this narrative of this person being an unfit parent or not being not being uh, OK to be around these children. All right. Um, so the next section here uh, is just mental health professionals in general. And so um, if we go a little deeper, there's many different kinds of mental health professionals. Um, and we'll go through those one by one here. Uh, but again, I want to remind you of what I talked about earlier about the, the training required um, and emphasized for these individuals is going to put an emphasis on trauma. And so uh, one of the big delineations here I also want to, to provide is uh, considering therapeutic counselors versus forensic counselors. Therapeutic counselors would be, I guess you could say, more run-of-the-mill going to a place saying, hey, I need help with anxiety, depression, and, and they're going to do everything in their power to help you. And one of the things those individuals are taught is to meet the client where they are. And there is a, a rapport building um, process where trust is built in and there, there's a process where that, where that counselor is going to hold space for that experience that is brought through their door um, and, and, and unfolds in front of them. And so, and that, that is a beautiful thing in and of itself in a vacuum as individuals are holding space for their clients and being there and empathizing. But in an, in an alienation dynamic that can be uh, corrupted and used um, because of what is being said uh, to those professionals uh, can be taken without any healthy skepticism. And that brings us to what I was describing earlier as forensic counselors. And these counselors are going to be taking a lot of court-related, family court-referred uh, cases where they are familiar with the dynamics of alienation estrangement. Um, and they are, um, are tasked with approaching these cases with that healthy skepticism and asking and challenging narratives and and doing this all for the whole systemic view of, of of these cases and how intertwined they can be and how a lot of competing narratives can be thrown around and that is a specific type of training and a lot of those individuals when they're taking these cases are coming through a court referral system court, court referral process and so it's important to remember that differentiation when you may or may not be trying to navigate this is is some um, professionals might not have that specific training towards the type of stuff that's trying to be highlighted um, by a targeted parent. Um, so going more deeper here, more specific, um, the, the ways that child counselors can be uh, manipulated here is, um, is really important to understand. Um, and so the big thing to, to remember is when you're dealing with minor children, the parents inherently must be involved as being the, the legal guardian of these individuals. And these child counselors are going to interact with these parents. And we'll talk about how targeted parents can, can insert themselves a little later in, this, in, the, in, in the presentation. But what I want to highlight here is that initial onboarding process is really um, 
a, a prime a prime example of how narratives can be set and an anchoring bias can take place is a targeting an uh, alienating parent can come in and set the scene and set the stage for a lot of what they believe is going on and and paint the other parent the targeted parent as this abusive dangerous person and give their side of the story and really try to enlist this child counselor as 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 leaning into their narrative so they can have this and this advocate on their side. And you have to remember that, especially for children, um, especially for children, mandated reporting for these individuals is required. And so when when things are said in session that um, that suggest abusive behavior or dangerous living conditions or, or any of these things, there isn't really much that a therapist can do in that situation but report it to authorities because that's what's required of their license. And so, a lot of alienating parents know that. And so there, um, a lot of this stuff comes through uh, that initial onboarding process to the parent, but also uh, the children will bring this narrative with them and the loyalty contract of understanding that they have to further this narrative in these sessions with these therapists. And they will say things about the targeted parent that really force uh, a therapist to say something because it's required by their license. And so an individual that doesn't have that proper training, you can see how that really puts them in a bind and they're going to err on the side of reporting this stuff because they don't really have much of a choice at that at that uh, at that time. So, again, just remembering that this is an, a, a, an environment that's ripe for this type of manipulation and this type of, um, uh, of, of, of development of aligned and uh, unwitting accomplices. And you have to remember that when you look at it on its surface, these therapists are really just trying to do their job. They're trying to help the client in front of them, and they're just trying to do what they can to alleviate pain um, and be there as a caretaker. But that's why um, it's important to, um, what, as navigating this, and we'll talk about this later, is really trying to find those forensic professionals that are going to be able to um, better navigate this process. Um, moving further into this, uh, parent counselors are going to be another place um, where uh, um, a narrative can take place. And this is sort of similar to the, the child counselor where that parent counselor is going to meet that client where they are. And so an, an alienating parent will go in um, to a session and say all these things about this targeted parent that um, that can really just deepen this narrative. And in worst case scenarios, that counselor will be called on in court and testimony and then and then parrot a lot of these things that come through. Further on, reunification counselors. So these are the counselors that are brought in to help uh, an alienated child re, um, reunify and, and get back together with this targeted parent. But a lot of them um, can be misled with, with poorly worded orders or, or gray areas. And it can be really helpful to have a really clear delineation of what's going on and why the reunification is, is necessary. Because reunification can also happen in, a, in an estrangement dynamic where abuse and neglect are, are going on. So if there is an alienation dynamic being, uh, being a, that needs to be addressed, but it's being framed as an estrangement dynamic, that reunification counselor is going to be using a lot of interventions that aren't necessarily or aren't going to be helping at all. It's going to be about mending the wounds from abuse and, and trying to trying to reconnect a relationship that was damaged by this abusive person. And if that's not actually going on in reality, then that can just further just deepen this alienation dynamic that could be happening. All right. Um, parent coordinator is one where it's a, it's maybe not as as ripe as some of the other ones we talked about, but it's just important to understand that parent coordination are professionals that are going to be called on by the court to help make decisions. Um, and I think this is um, this is a, a situation where maybe, like we talked about earlier, one of those things was put on a record or there's a false positive. And then all of a sudden, if uh, it gets deeper into this process, this parent coordinator might be making decisions based on a narrative that was put on there or maybe crystallized elsewhere. Um, and then they can rule in favor of an alienating parent uh, as a way to protect the child. Again, this is lower risk, but it's still really important to understand uh, if it gets to that point, another thing that needs to be addressed. Uh, furthermore, uh, abuse and trauma evaluators can come in. Um, and so that is um, a situation where um, 
if there are allegations of 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 abuse that have to be investigated, uh, there can be specific uh, abuse and trauma evaluators that can come into the process outside of investigative agencies. And if they have an anchoring bias or they have a specific background and training where that's what they're tasked with looking for, then they can have that confirmation bias when they're looking at some of the data and some of the things that these alienated children are saying. Um, and that can, of course, deepen um, deepen an alienation dynamic if some finding was uh, was was come across. Um, so it's important to understand that, that can be part of it too. Again, this would probably be deeper further on an alienation dynamic playing out versus maybe some of the other ones we talked about being a little earlier in the process. So uh, moving on. So another one is, um, is legal representatives. Uh, so these can be usually lawyers uh, that are in the family court system. And one, there can be just, you know, zealous advocates of their clients, which is what they're supposed to do. But if they are um, ignoring an alienation dynamic that's 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 playing out, they're going to be forcing the court to be uh, to be investigating and looking into abuse and neglect uh, versus trying to advocate for um, the mitigation of an alienation dynamic. And also you have to consider the 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 targeted parent and what type of uh, legal representative they have um, if they uh, if they have the training uh, needed to be able to address this um, alienation dynamic uh, that can that that needs to happen in order for you to be properly represented so that's another thing to consider uh, moving on uh, medical professionals is another one uh, so what will happen a lot of times is sort of similar to what we talked about with the child counselor is a stage will be set. And so an, an alienating parent will come in to a pediatrician's office or another doctor, and they will set the table um, to interpret specific examples or specific events um, as abuse and neglect scenarios. Uh, so we had a case once where um, um, a parent came in and brought in pictures of, of pretty bad sunburn or some bruises that were on, on a child's leg. Well, in some instances, sure, that can be abuse and neglect, or a kid was outside a little bit too long on a really, really hot summer day, and they were running around the yard, um, falling off a, a play set like kids do. And so you can see how uh, if, if there is an intense onslaught of this narrative coming from this one parent, um, and they don't really have any other anything else to go on, they can be um, forced to, again, at times... Uh, report to uh, investigative agencies like uh, like a protective services where a child is coming in and saying something and re repeating a narrative that they are saying based on a loyalty contract. Um, then all of a sudden that medical professional can be part of the system that is that is deepening an alienation dynamic. Um, but also, you know that there are some professionals that uh, will not take, uh, so to speak. And, and a couple instances when we've been doing evaluations is a parent has brought forth these things and tried to paint uh, a bump and bruise here and there as abuse and neglect. And they've said, nope, that's just sort of what kids do. And so it's just something to consider um, as you're going through this process um, uh, of just of knowing the different outcomes that can come of that. But again, it's important to understand how um, how routine things and medical professionals like that just doing their job can be twisted and manipulated uh, to deepen this dynamic. Um, so the other one is will be school staff. So this is something a child, if they are in school, they're with these teachers every day. And uh, a lot of times teachers have a lot of interactions with parents. And so the same thing can go on as a, a, um, a narrative can go forth um, and, and can be put forth in front of these teachers who, again, like a lot of these other professionals we talk about, have a pretty deep training around trauma and identifying trauma and helping children deal with trauma in a school setting to help facilitate learning. Um, and they don't really have a lot of workshops for teachers around parental alienation, um, at least for now. And so, um, so that can, again, deepen in all of a sudden these children and can be in an environment where uh, they have educators that are aligned with this alienating parent, and it all becomes just this deepening of this of this dynamic um, and so it's important to consider all this as you're navigating this the last one here um, is court related investigative agencies so this is a little different than protective services in michigan we call it front of the court but it's a very michigan term but a lot of times courts and family courts and district courts will have an investigative agency that's 
meant more for a holistic investigation of the whole dynamic rather than just a, an abuse or neglect. Um, and what happened in the past is um, in high conflict um, divorce cases, um, there's a, especially in cases where domestic violence is present, this is again in the past, uh, protective parents would be punished for being obstructive. So like, I don't want my kid to be around this abusive parent, but as you know, in estrangement dynamics, a child will have um, unrealistic hope or irrational hope of being with this parent, even if they are abusive and violent. And so, um, again, these parents were um, parents were punished. But as a as a um, as a reaction to that, after children returning to abusive parents in the past, which is of course a bad thing, then there can be sometimes an overcorrection where. Um, this obstructive behavior of protecting these children from this abusive person can be seen as protective rather than obstructive. And so um, it's important to understand that uh, so these, the training and, and some of the culture that's set into some of these in investigative agencies, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, can be an overcorrection from times where children were brought back to abusive um, uh, parents or, domest or, or domestic abusers back in the day. Um, so it's just important to understand how that uh, that can set in and these people can't be just trying to do their jobs of just trying to help um, help kids stay away from abusive parents because that's that is what they're supposed to do. But if they're blinded to the alienation dynamic that might be present or they're not looking for it, then all of a sudden they become unwitting accomplices to this alienation dynamic instead of addressing it right there. Okay, so this is, again, not a completely exhaustive list, but a good list of all of these individuals that can come into an, a situation and deepen an alienation alienation dynamic instead of addressing it head on and trying to reverse it. Um, and it's just important to understand that. So it brings us to the section of like, what do, what do we do here? Um, what, what do you do as an alienated parent, um, as a targeted parent here? And so the first thing I want to talk about before anything else is early intervention. Um, it's If it's not addressed, this will spread. This is not a situation that will just fix itself. Um, I, some people I've heard refer to it as, as a tumor, um, like a, that metastasizes and grows, and usually tumors just don't go away. They have to be intervened with. They have to be addressed. And as I mentioned earlier, there's, there can be a crystallizing effect that can take place when some of these professionals uh, make a ruling or make, have a finding of something um, that was fabricated, then all of a sudden it's it's somewhat irreversible and so uh, it's really important to get involved and start doing things early in the process instead of just hoping it gets better. Uh, so I want to make that very clear here. And so uh, and just more specific to the alien, alienated parents or the targeted parents is you want to find space for yourself. Um, and what that means is accessing services for yourself, getting a place to vent, getting therapy, getting coaching. Um, where you can have a place to talk about these just really intense feelings that come uh, from being a targeted and rejected parent. Uh, it's, it's, I've heard people use the phrase, it's like watching your children die a slow death in front of you. That will tear you up. There will be anxiety, there'll be depression, anger, rage, all these things. And if you're carrying that around with you and not addressing it, that's going to make you not be the best version of yourself. And you need to be the best version of yourself if you're going to navigate this process. And especially if you're going into working with these professionals or trying to interact with them is if you're bringing all that rage and anger and you're not processing it, um, it is going to uh, it's going to make things worse. It's not going to make things better. So you want to make sure you have this, um, have this space for yourself. And at the bottom here, I say, I say, don't take it personally. And that in other trainings you might've seen, or just want to remind you is when you're dealing with an alienated child, you don't want to take that alienation dynamic personally. You want to look at it as a whole, uh, because that, that the behavior from that child isn't necessarily targeted at you in this holistic, authentic way. It's more about the loyalty contract with the alienating parent. And the same thing is to be said about these professionals is, yeah, sometimes some of them are really going to be acting in a way that you see is unfit or not, not, um, uh, not competent, but you have to remind yourself that it, that they have a specific training and they have uh, a motivation in mind of really most of the time just to help a child in need. And so if they're, 
um, if they're ruling against you or painting you in this way, you have to remember that necessarily not to take it personally because it's emanating from this inauthentic place. Um, so just remind yourself not to take it personally and be centered in what you are and who you want to be. Um, again, so in a practical sense, you want to present the best version of yourself. Um, you've been accused of abusive behavior. You've been accused of being angry. Well, it's not really going to help if you show up to a therapist's office or a doctor's office and you're really verbally abrasive and angry because then all of a sudden that gives more evidence um, to further and deepen that belief. Um, and it's really hard to reverse that narrative when, uh, when it's set in. So you really have to center yourself um, and be the best version of yourself when you go into those interactions. Um, and another thing to do is just be involved, especially if you have um, joint legal custody is you were entitled to interact with all these professionals. And most of the time, parents do have that, um, especially at the beginning, a joint legal custody. And so you have to be there because if you are seeing this bad stuff happen where this um, this alienation dynamic is setting in and all of a sudden it just becomes hard to interact because there's vitriol and there's there's resistance and there's just it's just not a positive experience if you retreat then that void that you leave is filled in with more of an alienation dynamic narrative rather than you having your own voice and building trust with these professionals and having them hear your side of it from a from an adult um, proper conversation. And that's going to com combat that narrative um, rather than having a void filled by, um, by what we talked about earlier. Um, and so again, the, the final thing here is you, um, um, final two things here is you wanna work within the system. You, uh, you have to be able to work within the court system to file motions and you want to really at some point if possible is advocate for an evaluation um, is is finding legal representation that's going to be able to work with the court system uh, the court system is not perfect but you you have to do everything in your power within that especially when working with professionals to do it properly uh, because that's going to make it stick um, and so again the number one thing i would say is getting an attorney that understands alienation understands what needs to happen within these systems to be able to address this early um, and advocating for a partial evaluation, impartial evaluation, um, where, where this individual is going to be trained and knowledgeable of, of a full spectrum of resist and refuse dynamics, all the way from estrangement to alienation. Um, and finally, just being strategic. Uh, so there's... Um, one thing to consider is just refusing to participate in faulty treatment plans. This is harkens back to what we talked about with a reunification, where if they're trying to address estrangement that's not there, you have to challenge that, go back to court, get an order, try to clarify uh, why these different interventions have to happen. Um, but you have to present research and valid alternative treatments. You can't just dig your heels and say, I don't want to do that. Say, hey, I want to get an evaluation, try to identify why these resistant refuse dynamics are, are presenting themselves. And I want to get to the heart of this because this is my narrative and I wanna file motions and I wanna do all this stuff um, uh, so that you can be heard and be seen here. And just a final reminder here is that um, parental alienation can be counterintuitive for a lot of these professionals. So you have to be strategic, you have to empathize, is that if they're seeing a child come in and say, my dad hits me, my dad is violent, my dad's scary, I don't wanna to go to his house, is that it's really hard to for a professional that's not specifically trained to be able to cut through that, to be able to see the other side of this. And so it's just being centered in this knowledge, being centered in yourself, um, and being, being deliberate with how you address this as early as possible is going to put you in the best position to succeed. Um, the hard part about all this is that it's still really difficult no matter what. Um, but some of these steps that you can take that we've talked about here will allow you to um, to address these in, 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 in an effective way and in, in as effective way as possible. And so um, I, I challenge you to do the work within yourself um, at the Men's Resource Center of West Michigan at, at the Fountain Hill Center. We do offer coaching services for this type of this type of work and consultations and um, and 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 can I'll help you um, do the work that you need to do to try to navigate these really murky waters. Um, and so that's something that we can offer here. And you can also find these services elsewhere, uh, but just making sure that you do carve out that space for yourself to put your best foot forward. And I, um, but I also, I just want to thank you for listening and, uh, and wish you nothing but the best.
our next episode of Families Divided TV, attorney Jeremy Tanner will speak to us on high-conflict divorce and custody lessons, a lawyer's personal story.